Ben arrivati ragazzi, con grande estremo onore, oggi abbiamo niente poco di meno che Paul Marzurkiewicz dei Cannibal Corps. Grazie al Margrave Anarca per la preziosa collaborazione eh, dietro la regia e adesso presentiamo anche il nostro traduttore in simultanea. Quindi date il benvenuto, prima ovviamente di chiamare Paul in causa, a Hadmir che ci aiuta Buonasera. Nella, nella traduzione e possiamo dirlo, quindi uh, so, è ufficiale, uh, è ufficiale uh, lo vedo dalla regia che si è anche sistemato, quindi prima di entrare, giusto due parole veloci, faremo traduzioni delle domande in modo tale che possiamo seguirlo sia in, la diretta si può seguire sia in italiano che in inglese, su YouTube c'è il tasto sottotitoli vicino al player, quindi potete seguirla uh, tranquillamente. So, guys, please introduce your, uh, I will uh, have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Paul Mazurkovic from Cannibal Corps. Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Paul Mazurkovic, yeah. the drummer from Cannibal Corps is here. Ciao, Paul. Good to have you here. È un onore averti sulla nostra trasmissione Il Calice Nero in Italia, quindi veramente con estremo piacere. Partiamo subito con la prima domanda. Ritorniamo nel 1989 con la demo Cannibal Corps. La cover, quanto ancora attualmente è un qualcosa che, ti, eh, che si addice ai Cannibal Corps, che piace attualmente? So let's go back to 1999 and we're talking about the first Cannibal Corpse demo and how much the cover of said demo is still influencing what is the Cannibal Corpse aesthetic as of today. Uh, so you're talking about the, the cover of the demo tape? Yeah, the artwork. There was no artwork. Uh, it was just the logo. Ok, praticamente dice che non, non c'era l'artwork, c'era solo il logo. Ok. Quindi... Perfetto. Questo allora, and andando avanti nel, nel periodo Cannibal Corps, come siete, come siete riusciti a evolvervi in, uh, in tecnica soprattutto, ma anche nella brutalità, nelle cover, ad esempio una diversa dall'altra, però sempre con quella chiave brutale, eh, marchiata Cannibal Corps invece quanto con l'ultimo full length siete riusciti a uh, incentrarvi sulla tecnica più che sulla brutalità ok so he is asking on a technical side of Cannibal Corps uh, how this evolved during the years and this also including the brutal aspect and he is asking in the latest full length that you've released How do you manage to stay more on the technical aspect on his point of view rather than on the brutal side? Well, um, you know, I, I, I think just over the years, you know, we've, uh, we, I wouldn't say we changed. I'd say we've refined our sound. I'd say we've added some, some subtle kind of like uh, nuances throughout the years. I mean, I, I truly believe that we are the, still the same brutal death metal band that we started 33 years ago. Um, but, you know, as time goes by, you want to kind of do some little different things here and there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to ask the, uh, the songwriters, really, you know, that are, are, are coming up with the riffs and, and writing the songs, per se. Obviously, I'm not involved in a lot of the riff writing and songwriting in that aspect. Um, so, uh, somebody like Alex Webster, of course, the bass player in particular, you can see how his style maybe has changed over years of him becoming a lot more of a technical player and his songs becoming a lot more technical, of course, you know, I mean, I think we just try to, you know, to, to balance it out. I mean, we want to, we, we want to be brutal and I, I, I believe that we still are brutal. Um, is it the exact same brutality we are, uh, nowadays that we put out at butchered at birth tomb of the mutilated you know all those albums in the early days i would say no because you know we're just we're different people in a way we're the same people but of course we've grown over the years and we've um, got better at our instruments and you've gained experience and wisdom and all that you know those cliches so uh so i i mean i i 
you know, I, I think we always just look into it no matter what we do as time goes on, as you write your next record or your next song, you, you feel that, you know, Hey, it's us writing, um, that it's as long as it's it's heavy and intense and we feel it's brutal no matter if mm -hmm. there may be a little bit more technicality to it or not so um so i you know i i don't know I, I, unfortunately you know that that's a question probably better answered by like i said more of the guitar players the guys that are actually writing more of the music um but uh but you know um it's it's a good it's a good point and it's a and it's a great uh um question there of of uh you know that i know where he's coming from on that end but like i said i think i think the good thing with cannibal is you can listen from the very the beginning the first album and then you listen to the last album and all in between and you know it's it's cannibal corpse i mean but you're gonna find little subtle like i said those little differences that maybe weren't there in on the last record on the last song so uh so i think that's good we're, we're identifiable as cannibal no matter what we do um but you know we're just not going to kind of do the same thing over and over i guess um in our career so so basically you're trying to reach a new level of heaviness and brutality trying to find new ways to discover those places basically yeah also yeah. as for your playing style and whatnot yeah i mean um i i feel that um i've gotten to be a better drummer overall i mean you know mm -hmm. the band was a lot more raw in the early days i mean we're kids starting out in the late 80s and you know we're we're all new to our instruments we've only been playing for a year, couple of years and you know i i was never you know schooled uh, in 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 the drumming department i mean we're all just learning as we go you know so um i always look at it as the good thing with cannibal is that when you we got lucky I mean, everything fell into place with us and it fell into place fairly early. When you look back at the history where we make that demo tape in 89 and we're, we're recording our record in, in 90, we're not even a band about a year and we're already making a record, you know? So how, so how, how much, far, you know, some bands take years for that to happen, to, for them to sign a contract, you know, and, and then maybe, you know, I look at it in our case if say say it took a few four or five years well maybe some of those songs that are saying eaten back to life or butchered at birth or what have you maybe they never see the light of day because you always feel you're writing your better material as you go you know so mm -hmm. i always hypothetically always think to myself right you know what happened if uh you know, it was a few years later, maybe, maybe our first albums, you know, the bleeding type of material, you know, and, and we're not really, you know, wanting to go backwards kind of a thing. We want to go forward and it's what you always feel that you're doing. So, uh, so I think the fans looking back, like I said, we're, we're lucky that we got cannibal to, to, for everybody to see us grow, I guess, as a band, you know, because we didn't, we didn't find our identity fully, I think, until it was around, like I said, the bleeding in 1994 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of a cool, cool way uh, to look at it, you know, that, uh, um, but, but, but I, I believe that's when we really came into our own, you know, is, is around the bleeding time and, and file when, you know, we got better, uh, at, at our instruments at, uh, better songwriting and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and probably doing what we felt we wanted to do, but we just needed to, to, uh, ride along that path to get to that point, you know, being so young and, and inexperienced and not sure what we are re really doing you know so uh so yeah it's an interesting way to uh, you know uh, we have we have an interesting past i think you know and an interesting story of course praticamente ha, de ha detto faccio un attimo un riassunto e ha detto che comunque secondo lui non è che siano migliorati da un punto di vista tecnico sì sono anche migliorati però lui pensa ai cannibal corps come più una band che si è rifinita nel corso degli anni che comunque si sì, sono migliorati tecnicamente lui come batterista parla principalmente di Alex il bassista Alex che Max. comunque lui come anche gli altri due chitarristi sono loro che compongono principalmente il materiale quindi da un punto di vista più tecnico musicale è da chiedere a loro questa cosa però mh, in generale come Cannibal ha detto che ehm, sì, appunto, sono migliorati che comunque anche sentendo il primo materiale, lui ha parlato del primo demo del, dell'89, 
rispetto al materiale che è uscito di recente mh, son, comunque i Cannibal Corpse senti che sono loro che c'è la loro vena mm. però ho detto che già nell'89-90 quando è uscito il primo materiale loro loro non uh, suonavano gli strumenti da tantissimo tempo, lui ha fatto accenno a due anni, uno o due anni, quindi comunque dice eh, il materiale comunque man mano che vai avanti dici ah questo è il mio migliore materiale eccetera eccetera, quindi comunque loro sono cresciuti come persone e ritengono che comunque eh, cerchino sempre in qualche maniera di esplorare nuovi territori con, uh, con i loro strumenti pur cercando di rimanere i cannibal di sempre ok domanda di Margherita Van Ark e poi oh, Adimer uh, prima di fare una domanda io stesso <coughs> leggo una, un, un, un commento so before I place my own question I will, I'm gonna read a question from Nurglo here he, he asks about uh, why uh, you do not use the metronome it's your choice or band's choice or just uh, something that you do to have a much more uh, power in, in the sound, in also the attitude. In, I, I think Norglo said the live attitude of do not use the metronome. Well, it's been known, and we made this known, of course, throughout many interviews, and um, uh, I guess the, the, the person asking the question didn't do their research enough here. We started using the metronome when, uh, when we were writing the Evisceration Plague record. So I guess uh, for about, what, uh, <coughs> 13 years now we've been using the metronome um and you know and i made that i made that note uh, noted of course that is known um you know there was a huge change of course we we started out right with no metronome with no click track i mean back then in the day it was just about raw brutality and raw, raw power and you're not you know it, it, you just didn't even think of that i never wanted to use that i i felt that it wasn't needed and i didn't want it and maybe it's going to take away who knows i don't know um but r around just before we started right Writing for the Evisceration Plague album, Alex brought it up. He wanted to write to the metronome. He wanted to incorporate it, and, and he felt we'd be tighter, and you know the songs would be better, and all that. So, so uh, I mean, as a stubborn drummer, right? It took me years finally just to go. You know what? I'll give it a try. Let's let's. I'm ready. You know, I, I wasn't ready 20 years ago. I wasn't ready. I didn't want it. But you know, now that we're getting older and more experienced and more, you know, all that kind of stuff, and you know, you want to better yourself. And I felt, you know, why? Let's try this. And I'll tell you, ever since we put, you know, we we incorporated the click, it's been amazing. Yes, I mean, I I'm a better drummer because of that. I mean, and I don't really think it takes away any of the brutality. What whatsoever you know we're just a tighter band from for it you know um so every song every album we've written since evisceration plague to this point is written to the metronome to the click track and that's the way it'll be um you know until the end of time for us um you know i i i, I look at it now like yes i wish i would have maybe started earlier um would have probably helped me out a lot in a lot of ways um but like i said you know i just didn't want to whatever reasons you know being um stubborn about it and just maybe like you know, like i said i felt that it might have taken a back from the music but but i i think it, it it adds it helps and um you know here we are right you know what i say about 13 years in now and uh you know everything's done to the click so another question from another uh person here, Arian, she's talking about uh, the spring tension of your pedals. We know that you use uh, Charci Copito, Polish tank, so maybe you can start to uh, tell us about your pedal settings and uh, I want to ask you why you choose the, this brand of pedals. Uh, well, I mean, they're the best pedals in the world, there definitely are. Um, I would recommend them to anybody. I mean, they're amazing pedals, they're built like, you know, tanks aircraft carriers whatever i mean these things are indestructible i mean um the only thing i've ever had a problem with and and i rarely have a problem with anybody any pedal is going to be maybe you know you may break a beater here and there right you, you know you may break a spring um but other than that these pedals are just indestructible and uh they're very they're very fluent they're just you know you have so many settings and all that but uh 
yeah, I started using them, I guess, about a little over 10 years ago. Uh, Vladek, the owner, came to me at, uh, at a Czech Republic, came to Brutal Assault show when he was getting the pedals, starting to getting them going. And he, a huge fan of Cannibal Corpse, wanted me to use his pedals. And, you know, I, I was using the Axis, of course, at the time, like most drummers were and still are. Um, and um, I took him home and I was, you know, blown away. I mean, I never looked back. I was, I won't use anything else. These are, they're, they're great. So, uh, so uh, yeah, the spring tension though, I think I'm, I'm just pretty much in the middle, you know, nothing too, you know, just kind of like just that normal average right in the middle kind of middle ground for my spring tension, I guess. I do like my, my, my pedals a little more wide open though, you know? So, I mean, I would almost maybe, maybe feel that maybe a little, they may be a little looser than maybe most death metal guys. If you're really going for the extreme speed, you know, but I definitely like a good slap back and I like my pedals to, uh, to be a lot, uh, a little more wide open. So, so I'd say I'm, I'm a little bit in the middle on that tension. If, if, if anything, you know, borderline, a little bit looser than 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 most. Ok. Allora, uh, roba tecnica di batterista, aspetta, lo posso aspetta, 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 aspetta. Um, dimmi, dimmi. Eh, prima la traduzione in italiano così le assumiamo. No, dicevo, 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 stavo stavo per tradurre io inconsapevolmente, chiedo ah. scusa. Eh, eh, eh. Allora, praticamente ha detto per quanto riguarda la questione del metronomo, lui ne ha parlato in moltissime interviste, ma comunque loro come gruppo ne hanno parlato in tantissime interviste, e dice che praticamente loro fino al periodo di Evisceration Plague non l'hanno mai usato, nel senso che loro mh, ritenevano di essere... Mh, molto diretti, molto grezzi quindi eh, sentivano giusto però appunto quando si trattava si è trattato di scrivere le canzoni per Evisceration Plague Alex si è presentato col, col metronomo dicendo bene, le scritture delle canzoni dobbiamo farle col metronomo lui ha detto che è un batterista molto testardo da quel punto di vista e che ci ha messo qualche anno prima di abituarsi e dire va bene dai gli do, gli do una prova vediamo, vediamo come va e ha detto che comunque da un punto di vista di band non ha tolto nulla da un punto di vista di pesantezza nel suono ha semplicemente reso il tutto più coeso più incisivo da quel punto di vista e appunto da quando hanno iniziato a usarlo con Evisceration Plague da là non si sono più discostati e andranno avanti fino a che esisteranno i Cannibal Corps. Ah, yeah, di mer. Altra domanda. L'altra domanda... Sul fatto dei pedali, fatto dei esatto. pedali uh, perché lo chiedeva il ragazzo, eh, ha detto che lui usa i Charci Covid, ovviamente, ha un, un feeling molto più molle rispetto alla maggior parte delle persone che hanno una uh, tensione del, del pedale... Uh, molto tirata e lui l'ha conosciuti perché il proprietario da fan dei Cannibal Corps gli l'ha portati al Brutal Assault l'ha provati e, e gli sono piaciuti praticamente quindi uh, ha una tensione media e lui, a lui piace tenere il pedale un po' più molliccio in modo tale da avere questa wide open come ha detto lui questa azione molto più uh, ampia. diciamo morbida ampia, più morbida e so uh, Paul We can expect uh, uh, after the Supreme line by Sarci Copito, we can expect a, a Paul Mazurkevich signature uh, line. Uh, that, this, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll have to push on that. I never, I never talked about Vladek, the owner. I mean, you know, we're good friends and, uh, you know, he's, he's got a great pedal there, but uh, you know, I've, ne I've never, never brought that up to him and he's never brought it up to me. So, you know, maybe one day, who knows, you know? I think that will be great uh, with a, a, spla a, blood, a blood splatter uh, finish. It will be very, very brutal, in my opinion. I'll, uh, I, hey, I'll, I'll ask. I, all I can do is bring it up. You never know, right? <laughs> you have to try. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Dimar. Before, uh, okay, prima della la traduzione di Vladimir, c'è la domanda di Marco Zambruni, che dice, uh, asking about uh, what you wear on your feet while you play the the charge copito pedal well barefoot, uh, barefoot socks uh... well when when i first started playing them well you know like any drummer i mean i've gone through stages but i was always wearing just like a, a shoe of course you know like a sneaker on my shoe on my feet for the longest years many years and then i i as time went on i felt maybe you know maybe i'd like to go to something lighter and um 
I know a lot of drummers wear like a wrestling shoe or something like that, something real light on their foot. And uh, a guy came up with a a company um, in America here uh, called DB Drum Shoes. And they were a very light shoe made for drumming. And um, I was using those for quite uh, quite a few years there. Um, and I'm going to say of probably about five years ago where I went barefoot. So now I am completely barefoot. So when I first started wearing, using, you know, the, the pedals, the churchies, um, I was wearing this DB drum shoe and then, you know, I don't know why I just, you know, I'm at practice one day and I'm just, you know, playing and I'm going, you know, let me, let me try and go barefoot. I've never done this. And, and if I did, it would have been years ago. And I might, you know, might've made a made it through a couple songs and I went back to the shoe. So I, I took them off and I was playing um, one of the slower songs. I don't know something. And I, I just felt that I felt the pedal more like you do with your drumsticks, you know, when you're holding them, you know, your skin is on the stick. Well, I'm like kind of the same concept. Of course, my skin is on the pedal. I felt that I was feeling the pedal mo- a little bit more and it kind of helped me, um, you know, play some of the slower stuff, I guess. So, so I, I, uh, I haven't looked back since that. Uh, so I said, it's been about five years now and I am uh, playing barefoot. So. Praticamente lui dice di essere passato per varie fasi come qualsiasi batterista. Dice che appunto quando ha iniziato a usare la batteria in generale lui usava scarpe da ginnastica, ha usato calzetti e c'è stato un periodo dove utilizzava queste, queste scarpe create apposta per la batteria, le DB. Um, e praticamente ha detto che sono molto leggere perché lui cercava sempre qualcosa di un po' più leggero per suonare per sentire proprio il, um, la sensazione del pedale sotto il piede e stavo usando queste scarpe quando ho iniziato a usare il, um, il pedale quello che uso attualmente da là però si è spostato a suonare scalzo quindi meglio di così non si può cioè pelle contro pedale perché appunto lui ha fatto il paragone anche delle bacchette sulla mano che è molto più diretto molto senza interferenze praticamente okay. uh, DB e... drum shoes are still on the market scusami uh, you know I, I don't know actually I, I'm not yeah. sure I haven't talked to the guy in a few years um, I, 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 I don't really know I'm not sure ok ok We, we non, non si sa, non non si si sa, sa se siamo no. ancora... Vabbè, voi scrivete alla marca in questione. Comunque, prego, cattivo maestro. Eh, Adimer, vai con la domanda. Uh, uh, so, uh, I wanted to ask you um, if by any chance there's the possibility for you to, like... It, maybe it's a dumb question, so pardon me for that. <coughs> Um, do you feel nowadays that maybe it is um, some sort of interacting, like doing live streams of you playing drums, uh, like because some drummers are doing this nowadays, and I think about people like Gene Oglan. And um, what do you think about it? You know, yeah, I, I, it's uh, it's just I, uh, it's not my style. You know, like. I know. I mean, um, I've never really done drum playthroughs and, you know, and then I sit there and I go, I just, I just don't have the desire. I, I, I guess I don't, I don't look at myself as being a, a, a teacher per se. Um, okay. you know, so I guess, well, whatever videos get out there, of course, I know shows get, get recorded or, you know, sick drummer magazine will come out and, and uh, record or, or the Charchi Capito, they come out and, 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 you know, end up recording me a little bit. So, so I kind of leave the recordings, I guess, for the most part, um, few and far between, but yeah, I just don't have that desire to want to sit back and, And, and to do, do drum recordings like at the practice facility or do a live stream like that. So you never know. I mean, there's always a possibility, but it's just not, not something I'm too interested in, unfortunately. And I know it's, you know, for the fans, of course, I know there's, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of drummers, a lot of fans that would like to see that, but uh, you know, um, I, I just, I'm not feeling it. So, um, you know, but you never know. Right. Well, there's still material on YouTube. So, you know, in in a way they they can still find out how you do play songs yes yes for sure 
praticamente gli ho chiesto se mh, appunto da batterista lui mh, vede la possibilità di eventualmente fare live stream dove suona canzoni che, che siano sue o no e mh, perché appunto ho fatto l'esempio di Gino Oglan, che ad esempio lui ha un sì, canale Twitch, Twitch dove fa, fa queste cose, però lui ha detto mh, di non essere il tipo, nel senso che eh, comunque ogni concerto che fanno hanno sempre qualcuno, tipo, ha fatto l'esempio di Sick Drummer Magazine, che fa video, li pubblica su, sui propri canali, eccetera, quindi comunque dice c'è un... Um, c'è comunque del materiale disponibile perché lui non si vede come maestro in sé per far vedere come, come vengono suonate le canzoni, eccetera. Però ho detto che comunque per i fan uh, un pensierino ce lo può anche fare, nel senso che non si sa mai, in poche parole. Quindi questo è quello che lui sente di dire a questo punto di vista. Perfetto. Uh, Paul, al di fuori del del death metal che tu suoni ormai da decenni, eh, ci sarebbe un genere eh, che, ti, eh, che si addice proprio al, alla, me, alla metrica di Paul per suonare la batteria? Non lo so, tipo un jazz particolare o un blues mischiato a un qualcosa di estremo, ma non per forza death metal. Ok, so he's asking if there's a music genre that is not brutal per se but that may be um, describing the person of Paul um, as a musician let's say he talked about jazz or maybe blues influenced with maybe some other stuff um, and what not what do you think is more suitable for you Well, I think I um, am a product of just pure rock and roll. Um, that really has been my passion probably for the last 30 years, 25 years. I mean, I, I guess maybe it's just when I grew up, what, the time I grew up. I mean, I, I don't know. I find the late 60s, early 70s, you know, just rock and roll to be you know, the best music that's been ever created, in my opinion. I mean, it, it was, you know, so raw so new in a sense you know transitioning to you know like the precursor to kind of heavy metal and all that kind of stuff um and and and, and you know that's what i really feel that's when you know if you you, know, you look at my playlist or like my what's in my ipod or in my phone you know it's going to be a lot of those bands you know from the 70s and you know all these rock bands and and you know funny funny or ironically i guess you asked me this question because i don't know if you guys know but if it was it was put out there that i'm started a side project a and we just put out a teaser um a couple of weeks ago and the name of the band is called umbilicus and we are just what i was talking about we're like an old school kind of 70s style rock band you know and i'll tell you i'm having a lot of fun playing that kind of stuff i mean you know i love cannibal and i love death metal and that's what i grew up loving and still do to this day but man it is i'll tell you it's fun to just sit back and groove out you know and to play just kind of some rock kind of songs like that mm -hmm. you know and um and it's been fun you know so we're, we're working on our release now we put the teaser out we're uh, we're working on finishing up the songs hopefully within a few months this can get out to the to the masses because I'd, i'd love for everybody to uh you know we'd love for it to get out and everybody to, to hear it and, and it will it's just a matter of when um but uh yeah that's kind of that that's what i would i would say you know is where i'm at or what what's inside me really is is just you know rock and roll man you know that's where it's at So basically you use umbilicus to chill down a little in terms of heaviness. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I mean, it's got a, I would say umbilicus is like a, just a rock project. It's got tinges of metal hints here and there, but overall it's, it's rock, it's hard rock and it doesn't even need to be that hard. I mean, we're just writing some good songs that I feel that are, that were totally influenced by, like I said, what I was saying, 60s, 70s kind of style mm -hmm. rock and roll, you know, I'm um, just trying to write good songs. I mean, it's about the singing. It's about the song and the singing as I guess, uh, you know, like a lot of death metal, of course, 
drumming is a huge factor in death metal, you know, for the most part. In, in a band like Umbilicus, sure, the drumming is important, but it's to me, the importance is a, a great song and having the singer, you know, just bringing everything together and, and, and it's vocals, you know, what, 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 like a lot of the 70s bands were, you know. I mean, it's a mix of everything, but you got to have that song first, I guess, and that's what we're shooting for. So you basically are aiming for Umbilicus to be an ensemble rather than just a bunch of people playing instrument and playing art rock influenced from the 60s or 70s. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I got my good friend playing bass. That's, you know, and then we got a great guitar player and, a, and an amazing singer. So we want to write, uh, you know, we want to we want to be a band You know, we'll see what happens. I mean, it's a, of course, it's a side project and uh You know, but hey, we're not getting any younger. I mean, it, it's definitely a been, like I said, a passion of mine. So why not? Why not explore it while we can? And uh, you know, if if things happen from it, cool. If not, it was it's fun to do, and I'm I'm you know really happy with the songs that we we wrote. And you know, with any luck, maybe we'll be able to you know go on a tour or play some shows or what have you. So all all yet to be determined. Okay, praticamente ha uh, detto che. Per quanto riguarda come descrivere Paul come genere musicale, lui dice di essere eh, molto influenzato dalla musica degli anni 60, anni 70, hard rock, parliamo comunque primi metal, quindi come suoni. E lui ha detto che comunque se vedi molto anche le sue playlist, telefono, iPod, eccetera, noti molto questa cosa. E comunque ha fatto accenno al fatto che, sempre collegandosi al rock da cui è molto influenzato, un paio di settimane fa è uscito il teaser per un suo side project che si chiama Ambilicus. E e dice che questo suo side project rende molto l'idea di quella che è lui come persona e fa presente che lui cerca di vedere il tutto come una, un gruppo coeso cioè nel senso che sì um, nei gruppi, l'ho fatto ad esempio del, del death metal che comunque sì, il batterista deve essere bravo eccetera però che con quest'altro gruppo cerca di raggiungere un, un insieme più coeso di musicisti, nel senso che non deve esserci il personaggio bravo fino a se stesso, che tutti siano bravi, ha detto che comunque ha dei suoi amici molto fidati, il bassista, il chitarrista e il cantante che poi comunque lui mette tutto assieme. Poi l'ultima postilla per quanto riguarda uh, appunto Ambilicus ha detto che stanno continuando a scrivere materiale che però non si sa ancora effettivamente quando uscirà che appunto dipende da, da quanto servirà. Ok, Margherita Narca? Allora, mi ricollego, allora faccio, la faccio... I will uh, make the question first in Italian then in English. Uh, allora, ehm, spesso a volte Paul parla di essere il batterista dei Cannibal Corpse rispetto ad essere un batterista come in Dumb Talk TV per esempio con l'uscita di un nuovo side project ti voglio chiedere come farà in qualche modo a mantenere la sua identità in uno stile completamente diverso e come è difficile per un batterista al giorno d'oggi trovare la sua identità perché tramite eh, YouTube e tramite questo, questi enormi diciamo, stimoli che abbiamo noi batteristi nel vedere nuove tecniche, nuove, nuove cover, nuovi playthrough, uh, come, come un, un batterista che, che inizia bu, piano piano a trovare la propria identità. Quindi la ripeto in inglese per Paul. So Paul, you talked about your side project. Uh, I, I've seen many times your interview uh, with Drum Talk TV. Uh, you say that you are not a drummer, but you are the drummer of Cannibal Corpse in that interview. Uh, what is uh, what is difficult to be both the drummer of Ambilicus <coughs> and Cannibal Corpse at the same time, just to find your own identity? And in an age when uh, people start to drum, no, and they have a plenty of influence, plenty of videos, plenty of techniques that they can learn via YouTube, how much is uh, important for an artist, for a drummer, to find his own path, his own way to do things, and how they can achieve just... This second part of the question 
it's just a little bit of an advice for upcoming drummers that want to challenge themselves to find their own way like you because we know you as Paul of Cannibal, of Cannibal Corpse and you have your own style marked in the records, in the live show, in your drumming. So this is my question. More drum side than uh, music side, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's always been weird when I, when I, I get asked questions like that. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I just look at how I started and what I did and all that. I mean, I wasn't shown any, any you know, I wasn't shown anything nobody nobody taught me what to do or told me what to do or or i didn't seek out you know um how can i do this i just it, it, it all came from within now i don't know if that's the right way or not um but that's the way i did it and that's why i guess i never took lessons i just felt you know what i just want to do what i do um and if it's right or wrong it, i guess it doesn't matter as long as the, you know, the, the band is on the same page, right? You know, as long as the five of us or four of us, depending, you know, obviously five of us, but if you're talking hypothetically a, a band, if you're with, a, you know, the, 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 your musicians that you're in a band with, as long as everybody's happy, then I guess it doesn't matter. There was no right and wrong in our opinion here. Um, so we just were kind of just making stuff up as we went. I mean, we were at that era, of course, of like exactly death metal was new. So the, it was just a crazy style here that's, you know, coming from thrash metal but it was almost kind of like there's no there's no rules there's you know you're just doing you 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 like a punk rock attitude in a way you know you're just you're doing what you feel is right and um you know so that's the way my attitude was and i guess i would always just tell people like when they ask me you know what you know what we any any advice it's just like well just really follow your dream follow follow your passion follow what's inside of you you know i mean i think that's important um to be yourself and um and i and i was and i and i think most of the and i don't look at myself exactly as a great drummer or a great musician or anything i'm no better than anybody you know why me uh, in cannibal course but um i was was just doing I, I, I wanted to do what I wanted to do you know I, I, I had a will and I found a way um, so um, I, you know that's all I can tell people is if you really if you're passionate about your instrument and, and, and no matter what kind of style it is drumming if you want to be the fastest drummer in the world you want to be the most technical or whatever you know you'll you'll probably you'll find a way to do it if you really really want to you know um, so, uh, yeah, that's why I always looked at myself as being the drum, just the drummer in Cannibal Corp because I never set out to be the best drummer. I never set out to be like, you know, uh, I can do everything, which of course I can't. And there's a lot of drummers that can, you know, and if that's what they want to do, then all, that's fine. I just wanted to play, I wanted to play music in a band. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be, uh, known as, you know, uh, the Paul, the drummer, you know, like I'm standing out or anything like that. Maybe, maybe I do, maybe we all do in our, on our own ways. That's for everybody to decide. And that's just the way it, it, it ends up being. But, but it was part of a team, you know, we're, we're trying to make great songs and we're trying to be heavy songs. And I, I just was doing what I felt was right for these songs and, and everybody was happy. Everybody's on the same page, like I said. So that's what we do, you know? So, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, up and come or just do, you know, follow your, follow your heart practice, of course, you know, just be patient. But, you know, if you really have that, like I said, I, I always say, if you have that will, you'll find a way to get it done. Praticamente vi ho detto di non avere un approccio effettivo, nel senso che per quanto riguarda il, il materiale che lui fa, fa uscire sia con i Cannibal Corps che, che proprio con gli Ambilicus, lui riesce a far coesistere le due realtà. Cioè non, lui trova molto facile questo approccio perché dice lui cerca di fare per la band quello che è giusto che sia per la band e tutti quanti devono essere contenti che siano quattro persone, cinque persone coinvolte tutti devono essere felici quindi questa è la, principalmente la sua maniera per ehm, rendere unico il suo essere batterista perché lui pensa a sé un po' come un batterista tutto tondo piuttosto che come Paul il batterista e oltre a questo lui dice che per quanto riguarda anche proprio il materiale all'inizio di Cannibal Corpse, Cannibal Corpse era un territori nuovi, 
lui è autodidatta come batterista, quindi non, non ha mai cercato di imitare qualcuno, lui ha cercato di trovare il suo stile all'interno di un mondo completamente nuovo, perché appunto lui dice che il death metal comunque è influenzato dal trash, e però cerca di tenere un'attitudine molto sul punk rock. E questo appunto influenza un po' il suo modo di vedere la musica in generale. Appunto, mi ripeto, eh, cerca di fare della band quello che è giusto che sia per la band. Tutti devono essere felici e nessuno o meno. Insomma. Tutti in collaborazione. Esatto. Vai Adiman, a te la domanda. Allora, um, so you talked about Umbilicus for the ones that maybe don't know the project because it's brand new. Um, what do you want to say about it? Uh, of course, we said earlier that um, the band is 60s rock influenced, 70s rock influence, but what do you want to feel to say? about the project itself well i mean i just uh you know think we said i think it's a great project i mean i mean i'm very 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 happy with the songs that we wrote i mean obviously i'm only one fourth of that project as well like uh like cannibal you know i'm, I'm the piece one piece of the puzzle um but we got a great guitar player taylor nordberg which you probably heard his name before he plays in a band called the absence he's in that uh in human condition right now Um, he's, you know, he's a, an amazing guitar player and, and, and he had the same kind of, um, uh, feel that, uh, that, that I did, you know, loving this kind of music and he's never been in a band like this. So we actually approached him, myself and the bass player, whose name is Vernon Blake, um, a guy my age and good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, we just, we, we, you know, we love that kind of music. And then we got Taylor involved in the band and Taylor's an amazing songwriter. <laughs> and he, we wrote 10 songs. We got 10 songs that we just feel are just really just solid songs. I mean, you know, like I said, when you hear it, when everybody hears it, I think they're going to be definitely a little bit like, you know, there's some, I, I think the drumming's good in it, but it, by no means is it meant to be right. Oh my gosh, listen to what Paul's doing. Yeah. I'm filling in the song. I mean, if, if it's the most basic beat, which I don't care as long as it fits with the song is, you know, what what's supposed to be there for the song, you know, like a lot of rock was back then, you know, um, it's about the riffs. It's about the songs. It's about the vocalist. So we have a great vocalist, uh, a guy named Brian Stevenson, and he's just amazing. I mean, he's just uh, an incredible, incredible vocalist. He uh, wrote all the lyrics, tied everything together, you know, really made the songs come to life after we had everything written. So, um, so I, I, I just, I hope people give it a chance. I mean, I think they're, you know, when they hear a project, right, you know, they're going to be expecting, you know, most projects that happen or that have happened, say, with members of Cannibal, they're maybe a little more intense or, you know, this is definitely going to be a lot more mellow than they're used to. But I mean, it's, it's, it's just regular good old rock and roll, you know? So, uh, you know, they're not, if they're expecting me to be, you know, it to be a, like, you know, heavy in any ways, I'd say it's got, like I said, tinges of heaviness, but by no means would it even be considered maybe metal at all, you know? Um, and uh you know just give it a chance give it a shot i mean i'm i think it's great i i love it i'm so happy i'm so proud of what we've created and i i really can't wait to, to get this out for everybody to hear it you know because that's how excited i am praticamente lui ha detto che per quanto riguarda il progetto Ambilicus, perché appunto magari qualcuno si è collegato dopo, comunque anche giusto per dare un'infarinatura generale, visto che ne avevamo parlato prima, eh, gli ho chiesto di dare una sua opinione del progetto, spiegare un attimo quello che è, eccetera. Praticamente il progetto comunque è molto orientato al rock anni 60 e anni 70, come si diceva in precedenza, ed è un gruppo composto da quattro membri. Taylor Nordburg alla, alla chitarra, che è chitarrista anche degli Absence, da Vernon Blake, Vernon Blake al basso e Brian Stevenson, che è il cantante. Praticamente lui ha trovato in questo gruppo di persone tutti i grandi musicisti e anche per quanto riguarda Brian Stevenson che si è occupato lui della stesura dei testi e de delle linee melodiche della voce e ha trovato questo gruppo comunque dove 
tutti sono parte dell'insieme, nel senso che anche per sé ehm, non vede eh, il suo lavoro, di cui comunque è molto fiero, non va a dire, oh guarda Paul cosa sta facendo, lui dice, guarda nell'insieme come suona bene il tutto, nel senso che comunque fa, sono robe molto basilari da un punto di vista musicale comunque molto più pacato ovviamente per quanto è il materiale dei Cannibal Corpse però comunque dice che hanno dieci canzoni scritte al momento che appunto come dicevamo anche prima stanno aspettando solo di registrarle e da un punto di vista generale dice che comunque secondo lui vale la pena perché dice che è materiale molto valido e appunto vale la pena ascoltarlo e poi siamo curiosi, di senti- siamo curiosi di sentire voi, Paul, in questa nuova veste eh, hard rock, insomma. Prima di, uh, prima di porre la mia domanda, agganciandomi anche alla domanda di Marco, faccio fuori la domanda ad Alan. Prego, Alan. Allora, um, se invece andiamo su uh, delle pellicole, quindi pellicole horror, uh, quale film si addice proprio alla musica Cannibal Corpse? Uh, Fulci, Bava, Dario Argento quali di questi uh, registi proprio riescono a incarnare in maniera totale sia la parte lirica della band e sia la parte proprio della band uh, degli, proprio dei musicisti della band um, so he's asking if you have to pick um, a movie an horror movie which can describe as best as it could Um, Cannibal Corpse, what do you think um, about a movie, let's say maybe from Fulci, Bava, Argento as a director? Um, what is your opinion on it? What do you think that can describe it better? That's a, that's a tough one. I mean, there's a lot of great horror movies out there. And yes, and, and you know, the Italian directors, some of the best, Fulci and Argento, I mean, some amazing movies that they have uh, created over the years. Um, you know, yeah, that's, that, that is, that's a tough one. I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, when we got the, you know, the, the day of the deads and the dawn of the dead and the dead movies as well. I mean, that, that obviously those are, those are great ones too, that, you know, fit the cannibal theme with, with, um, uh, you know, the zombies and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, You know, man, that's that's a hard one. You know, I, I don't know why. I'm just going to pull this one out just because it's one of my favorites, and I haven't seen it in a long time. But um, you know, some, there was some pretty some pretty sick. Some, in my opinion, it was a, it was a, it was a great movie. Um, Gates of Hell was was one of the best. You know, and I remember when watching that growing up was just like you know we were blown away by that. Um, so you know that that's a hard one to answer though. That would really um, that would that would uh, describe Cannibal because if I I guess if you know I'd have to maybe also lean towards like I said some uh, maybe like a like a Day of the Dead kind of a movie you know um, just where it's uh, you know the zombies attacking and uh, you know that kind of thing. So uh, but that, that that one's a tough one. Praticamente lui ha detto che intanto è una domanda molto difficile per lui perché ha detto che comunque si registi come come Fulci, lui li adora, però ha detto che comunque se dovesse scegliere un film prenderebbe film horror basati su zombie, quindi ha parlato dell'alba dei morti viventi, comunque quel quel genere là dove ci sono zombie che sbranano praticamente ha detto che però se ci dovesse essere un film specifico che possa descrivere al meglio Cannibal Corpse sarebbe Gates of Hell che comunque è un film che lui ha da tanto che non vede e che comunque gli rimane nel cuore perché è da piccolo che lui lo vede quindi appunto se dovesse descrivere Cannibal con un film direbbe sicuramente Gates of Hell un attimo Margrave Narca, un'altra domanda e poi lascio lo spazio completamente a te Ma allora se Paul, invece eh, voglio entrare dentro il drum kit di Paul eh, sapendo quali piatti usa eh, quali bacchette la marca tipo la Promark o la Vic Firth, quale di queste due marche secondo lui è la migliore e la peggiore 
eh, anche ehm, le pelli di batteria quanto sono importanti per il death metal la Evans rispetto alla Remo Sabiate quante queste due eh, pelli riescono ad avere un suono più pesante proprio eh, che, a Paul, eh, che Paul adora ok so um, he asked um, this is a technical question about your drum set and what not about your playing so he's asking first off uh, what kind of symbols are you using which brand which sizes in the first place uh yeah i've been using zildjian symbols probably for the last uh 15 years maybe or so um you know got a a, a great endorsement from from them you know i think the zildjian are the best symbols in in the world um i mean there's some great companies of course but uh you know, Zildjian, uh, you know, it's Zildjian, you know, I think they're top of the line, but I'm using a customs, um, Zildjian, a customs for the most part on, on, uh, uh, my hi hat, my hi hats, a customs. And then, you know, I obviously don't use a lot of symbols. I only have three crashes. So I'm using, it depends. And, and, and I'm not particular. I mean, I like the a custom line, but you know, I think I may, I may have like just rock crashes up there. It might have a projection crash. I mean, um you know but I'm, i i got two 18 inches 18 inch symbols and i got a 17 in the middle and, and then i use a um a, 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 a 20 inch china type and i think i just i don't think that's an a custom though that's the oriental china type okay. i believe from zildjian and uh and then i'm using i have a, a couple of zildjian rides that i use um 21 inch I've always, for some reason, you know, I started out using it. I had a 21 inch Peisty Rude, you know, that I used for the longest time. And that's like actually the only symbol that I have left from the back in the day. I mean, I would have, I've had this thing probably, you know, I don't even know, 35 years, um, which is kind of cool because of course symbols break, but this ride has lasted forever. But then I went to, so, so I went to a 21 and I think I just have a, 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 a Zildjian rock. I got a couple of Zildjian uh, rides, so I might uh, a, a Rezo ride. I got. I might mix it up here and there, um, and then that's it. Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously don't use a lot of symbols, but I do love the Zildjian A custom line. And, Because uh, of, uh, scusa mi uh, per completare Alan. What about uh, Alan is asking about the, the drum kit and also uh, your choice about uh, the tom, uh, the, the tom heads, your sound. Uh, how do you achieve it, uh, the brand of drums, the wood, and all the kind of stuff, because people in the comments are asking about it, so uh, we figured out to ask you. Yeah, it's going to vary. Thing. Yeah, it varies. You know, like, of course, when we play in Europe or, say, I come over and we play in Italy, I'm not using my, my drum kit per se, you know. I mean, we have to – I'm using my company. I use D-Drum drums these days, um, and it's a great kit. I think it might be an ash kit that I use over there when I come – Um, and it, it's not the one I'm using, say, in the United States when I'm touring here. Um, I actually have a custom kit that they built for me uh, made of maple, and um, it's made to my spe specifications. So I got 20 by 22-inch kick drums, so they're a little bit longer. Um, you know, um, so, so it varies. I mean, um, yeah, I wish I could be more consistent and, and have drums – um the, you know play the same kit no matter where i go in the world uh, you know but yeah. we're not we're not we're not metallica you know so so unfortunately we, we we don't we don't have those liberties to do that as my dog barks his head off in the background here i'm sure you can <laughs> no, hear no problem no problem um, of course. Oh, gosh um i'm sorry guys um no, no problem. but uh um, no problem i may have to go over there and tell him to shut up um but uh Yeah, and, and then for drum heads, it varies. I mean, I like Remos. I mean, Remos and Evans, I guess. And it, you know, and, it, and I'm not very particular. It's not like I sit there and I go, well, I need to use the G2s from Evans or I need to use, you know, this or that. I mean, I do like, um, I do like the uh, Remo um, snare heads, though. Um, and I can't think offhand which, uh, it, what, what it was. Um, 
Uh, he said, I'm, I'm so non-particular when it comes to stuff like that, you know, like some drummers are very adamant on, oh, I, if I need this, yeah, I need yeah. that. I know. I'm, I'm kind of like not that guy, you know, it's okay. like, you know, so I switch it up. Yeah, maybe I'll try a two ply head. Maybe we go to us, you know, we go to a, a single ply head. Hey, let's try the coated head. OK, you know, I mean, so so it, it kind of varies, um, you know, but uh, but I but 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 when it comes down to the companies, I think Remo and Evan are the two top uh, uh, drum head companies for sure and um you know and and i like I, I like the d drums i use i mean i i went with d drum they're a local company here in tampa and uh you know they're dean guitars basically dean guitars d drum drums and um you know the fact that they're local like this and i can go to the factory and you know get hardware you know get things fixed if i needed to and you know and all that kind of stuff i you know they're 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 very uh, accommodating in that way, and uh, you know I, I like the fact that they're local that way, and they and they, and, and they wanted me as an artist, so that's that's been a, a huge uh, a huge thing. And I about uh, Alan asked also about sticks. Oh yes, okay. Hold, I'm gonna tell my dog to shut up. Hey, no problem. Stop. Uh, Uh, no, praticamente ha detto Stop. che lui usa una Stop. batteria che è in Ash, quindi è in uh, questo legno in Ash, quando vieni in Europa. Lui di solito si è fatto fare una batteria custom dalla D-Drum che è in Florida, quindi lui la può uh, raggiungere. Ed ha una cassa 22x22, uh, tre tom, due timpani, e dice che lui non può avere, vorrebbe avere tanto la, la stessa batteria ogni volta, ma... Uh, non, può, uh, non, non, non è come metallica quindi dove c'è il rental kit la diciamo sia adatta però più o meno le misure sono quelle ho detto riguardante le pelli non è il tipo che ci sta molto a fissare le utilizza un po' uh, tutte quante sperimentando appunto le doppio strato, le singolo strato però dice che la sua scelta va Remo ed Evans e now I asked about uh, the, the sticks I think, I think that you are a, a Vic guy Vic Furch uh, Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I've been using Vic Firths for the last few years, and 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 that's something that's changed over time. I was using Pro Marks, um, or I mean, I'm sorry, I was using Regal Tip actually okay. for a long time in the early days, and that was a local company out of Buffalo, um, Niagara Falls. So it was kind of cool to be using local sticks, um, you know, from home kind of a thing. When when we you know we lived in Buffalo, obviously we're from there, but I used those for years. And then I've, you know, I, I, I tried Pro Marks for a little bit. And, you know, I'd say I'm, I've been with Vic Firth, though, for the last, um, I don't even know, six, seven, eight, you know, 10 years, maybe at most, you know. And then I'm always just changing what kind of, I don't have a signature stick, of course, but okay. I'm always kind of changing it, changing it up. My weights, my, you know, trying different ones. Like right now I'm using the Vic Firth. It's, I can't believe I'm using this stick. It's uh, the classic rock stick. I mean, this thing is like a baseball bat, you know, and it's, it's crazy, you know, and it's, it's long and it's thick and it's heavy, you know, but, um, but I found it to be really, uh, uh an awesome stick and it, I don't know, the, it, the heavier the stick I've, I've come to realize the better, you know, rebounds you get, the, you know, the, 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 the harder it hits the drums and, you know, maybe it builds my muscles, maybe a little bit more or what have you, but, uh. But that's what I'm using right now. So, you know, that could okay. change in time. Who knows? But yes, Vic Firth's I'm using. So. Okay. Allora, vado, vado anche vado con la domanda. Ah, comunque, ragazzi. Vic no, Firth. prima la traduzione, prima la traduzione, ragazzi. Okay. Ha detto che ha, prov ha provato di tutto. Regal Tip da Buffalo, uh, Pro Mark. Però lui è da molto tempo che sta con Vic Firth. E lui utilizza questa serie che si chiama Rock, che praticamente è, è più grande delle due B, quindi lui ha de la definita grande quanto una mazza baseball. Lui si trova molto bene per il rimbalzo, per, uh, anche per fare build up dei, dei, diciamo, anche durante il suo playing. E si trova molto bene con questo modello e dice ne ha provate tante, ma alla fine questa è la sua uh, scelta di bacchette. Ok, allora una domanda a testa, una Margaret Van Ark e poi Adimer. Uh, faccio andare prima di Mare perché l'ho interrotto per uh, scusarmi. <ride> no, beh, eh, volevo fare la traduzione, ma hai fatto te. Allora, um, I willing to ask you what um, maybe it's a tough question at the moment because of everything that's going on all over the world. Um, the the COVID thing. Uh, it's 
always the same thing. And I'm willing to ask you how this in, is influencing, in a way, the music you are producing, both with Cannibal Corpse and um, I forgot the name. I'm um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, um, how do you think this is influencing it? I mean, you have new material coming for Umbilicus, and I guess you have new material coming for Cannibal Corpse as well. And what is going on with this? I mean, yeah, I, I don't think it's influencing us whatsoever. You know, I mean, I think um, it, it, it just, you know, if anything, it inf it's influencing us, of course, playing live, you know, I mean, and, and in a negative way, because we're not playing, right? You know, we've had to delay tours like every other band in the world. So, so that's, uh, you know, but, but I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't look at it as it being, well, you know, we're going to write this or we're going to write that way because of what's happening in the world. But, you know, I, th I think we, we just do what we do and, and we do what we do in both bands, right? Cannibal's always going to be doing what Cannibal does, no matter what is happening around us. You know, it's this, it, it, it is what it is. And same thing with Umbilicus. I mean, when we wrote these songs, I mean, and right, that was done pretty much during the pandemic. The band was formed during a pandemic. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, right. We're, you know, we're in this time. It's like, what, well, while we're dealing with a pandemic and we're starting a new band, you know, and we're just right, playing music we want to play. And it has nothing to do with what is happening around us. Basically, you know, maybe there's some lyrics. I don't know. I mean, I, I actually don't know any of the lyrics for the umbilicus. I mean, and of course the one song on violence unimagined, you know, con condemnation contagion. I know Eric wrote that song and he wrote the lyrics to that. And I believe that came right at the, you know, when we, when he was writing those lyrics, they may have been a little inspired by obviously the pandemic happening because I believe that was going on when he wrote those lyrics. So, so it kind of influenced him maybe to write, that kind of a song so other than that i mean that's really it you know when it comes down to the music and it comes down to anything um you know that we're gonna do it, it, it there's never been any inside outside influence no matter what's happening around us we just do what we do praticamente lui dice che allora per quanto riguarda la musica che è stata scritta perché gli ho chiesto secondo lui come la questione pandemica può aver influenzato in qualche maniera il, la scrittura del nuovo materiale che forse uscirà dei Cannibal Corps come anche appunto il materiale degli Ambilicus. degli Ambilicus e lui ha detto che non ritiene che questa pandemia abbia influenzato la scrittura de, dei pezzi eccetera l'unica roba che ha tenuto ovviamente a precisare che l'unica roba che ha influenzato è il fatto di non poter più suonare dal vivo per ovvie ragioni e appunto loro ritengono di fare quello che vogliono cioè indipendentemente da tutto non importa quello che succede loro scrivono musica e cercano di non farsi influenzare comunque da quello che sta succedendo in giro per il mondo ha detto che l'unica cosa che può essere stata influenzata dalla, dalla pandemia dal punto di vista musicale è il testo di Condemnation Contagion. Ha detto che quello forse è l'unico accenno che può ricollegare a, però non è sicuro neanche lui. E ha detto che comunque anche Ambilicus è nata al momento della pandemia, cioè quando era era in corso e ha fatto appunto cenno che comunque loro hanno fatto anche là come per i cannibal non gli interessa niente a loro piace scrivere buona musica ok Margaret Van Ark ultima domanda uh, before placing my own question I, I'm reading question uh, from people uh, Nurglo asked about uh, the lyrical if you can have a, a little briefing about the lyrical team of Umbilicus He said the uh, lyrics will be extreme like Cannibal Corpse or uh, a, a, a 70 rock for all ages, he, he wrote to us. If you can, uh, I know that uh, probably you are not uh, the, the, the guy that writes the lyrics, but he uh, wants to know something about it. And also Marco asks, asks about uh, 
if you remember your first Italian show with, with Vader and Immolation in 1996. Well, first off, yeah, the umbilicus. I mean, it's just going to be music. It's just going to be subjects. I think about you know, for for everybody, it's definitely not going to be brutal like Cannibal Corpse. I mean, there might be some you know some darker subjects here and there, but I think uh, yeah. Unfortunately, like I said, I'm not. I didn't write any of the lyrics, and um, and I know, and I don't know a lot of the lyrics. Um, you know, some of them are just some kind of cool stories um, that he wrote, and then he I mean, he might have a little bit of some kind of a political view here. Here and there, I and what that is, I don't know because I'm I'm not into politics. So so it's almost one of those weird things where I, you know I just I, I, whatever he wrote about I, it didn't matter, and that's that's the way I always looked about music in general. You know, when I hear music, I don't I don't listen to the lyrics. I mean, it, sometimes you you yeah you have no choice, you know, and you're gonna go okay, and maybe some may resonate, but that never was the case with me. It was always you know, man, that song is great. What is he singing about? I don't know. And I don't care because it just sounds good. You know, um, the sound of the vocals, the sound of the music, right. You know, and I always looked at that's, that's the important thing. It doesn't matter what is being said. So on, so, so I'm, yeah, kind of, kind of a uh, uh, tough to answer right now. I, I wish I, uh, you know, would, would have a better answer for that, but it's, I, but I know it's not going to be death metal style. Of course, like I said, the music is, is not that. So the lyrics aren't going to be that. There's going to be for the, you know, like, like you said, all, for, for all ages, I guess, for the most part. Um, so that'll, you know, it should be fun, should be interesting. Um, and, um, you know, it's tough to remember the first show. I mean, yeah, with, uh, I, I, I'm trying to recollect on where, 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 where in Italy would, did we play? I can't even remember. Do you guys know? Do you remember what, um, was it Rome? I, I, did we play was, Rome? I was born in 1996. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, it might have been in Rome. I think I remember we played Rome a lot in the early days, you know? So maybe it was in Rome, our very first show. Um, you know, I'm trying to remember, you know, even the city exactly, but I'm going to think it was in Rome and, and, it, you know, and it's really hard to remember, um, that tour per se too. Um, you know, so much has happened of course over the years and through, and, 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 and since then. So, um, so it's hard to remember the exact first time I'd have to probably sit and really think, and maybe I would remember, maybe I won't, I don't know, but, but I'm, I, I you know, all I know is when we, anytime we went to any country, um, for the first time, it was, it was always incredible. Of course, you know, just knowing you're going somewhere new was amazing and still is, you know, I mean, those are always going to be the most exciting times, you know, when you can finally hit a place that you never played before. Um, kind of hard these days for us since we've played pretty much everywhere. But, uh, but I, I, I do tell you, I will, I can tell you that it was an exciting time because, um, you know, back then, yeah, hitting, hit, hitting countries that we've never played like Italy at that point, then, uh, it, it was amazing. So, uh, you know, I wish I could remember the exact, uh, first show, but unfortunately I really just can't right now. Uh, people is commenting, say that it's near Milan, uh, with okay. George. So uh, I, okay. I don't know. So maybe yeah. someone can tell, uh, can tell us by comment on, uh, on the video. S somebody might have been there. I, I, yeah, I, I just don't remember. But yeah, if it was in the mid '90s, of course, George was in the band. What '96? You know. Yeah. So if it was, at, you know, on that tour with Immolation, we're talking, uh, right? Uh, I'm sure he was, he was the man. Um, but yeah, I kind of find, kind of find it hard to believe we didn't play back in the early days when we came over those first couple of tours. But I, you know, I guess we didn't, you know, so. Prima di fare la traduzione, faccio la domanda così si collega sempre Topic Italia. Hey, Paul, since uh, in our podcast here, il Calice Nero, we, uh, we want to give the space from also uh, big names as you, uh, but also to underground bands. Uh, you have something to say to people that are starting out a band and uh, since we are uh, from different parts of Italy, uh, do you listen to some of Italian death metal? you have some Italian bands to recommend to people? Well, you know, I mean, I, you know, kind of getting back to the question about the drumming, you know, you just got to, you just got to follow your passion, do what you want to do. You know, I mean, if you really, music is that kind of, kind of, uh, of an art form. 
you know, you, you shouldn't be doing it other than the love of, of the music you want to play, you know, um, don't do it for fame or fortune or whatever. So you just, you got to follow your heart and, 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 and be true to yourself, I think in, in music. I mean, that's, I, I think utterly important. Um, you know, so I would just, you know, you don't give up, you try, that's all you can do. Maybe, maybe it works, maybe it don't, you know, but you, but you, you don't know unless you try. And, um, you know, that's all I can really say about that. Um, but yeah, over the years, um, you know, well, we toured with one, you know, I don't listen to, I don't listen to a lot of death metal much anymore. I'll tell you the truth, you know, I mean, um, so I, I, a lot of new bands out there, a lot of stuff that's going, I'm kind of like living under a rock these days. So I don't even know what's happening for the most part, but it, it, you know, good guys, we toured with hideous Divinity a few years back. And that, okay. you know, that, that, you know, they were, you know, great, great, uh, technical death metal band, you know, um, so and, and cool guys. So, so I, I remember, you know, remember, remember them pretty well. That was more recent within the last few years. I know we, we, we did the tour with them and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to think of any uh, Italian death metal. Um, I don't know why nothing is coming to mind, um, at this point. So, um, I'm sure if I heard a name or two, I'd probably go, oh yeah. But I I can't okay. I can't think of anything right now. Ok, inizio con la traduzione di tutto prego, quanto. Prego. Allora eh, parto dalla prima domanda che è la, quella relativa ai, ai testi del suo altro progetto, gli Ambilicus. Praticamente ehm, lui dice che purtroppo non si ricorda troppo dei testi, sicuramente non hanno nulla a che vedere come tematiche rispetto a quelle dei Cannibal Corpse, magari avranno degli sprazzi un po' più giù di tono, diciamo così, come, come mood, però appunto in generale ehm, sarà sicuramente diverso, un po' più adatto a tutte le età come materiale e appunto lui ci tiene a ricordare non si ricorda neanche benissimo i testi appunto non occupandosene a lui interessa che la musica sia figa in poche parole poi la seconda domanda riguardo il, il concerto il suo primo concerto in Italia ha detto che non si ricorda molto di quel, di quel periodo perché comunque è stato molto tempo fa e che comunque dice che ogni posto che va comunque se, se lo ricorda nel senso che gli piace si ricorda che c'è stato che quando c'è stato come periodo però appunto non nel dettaglio cosa sia successo e comunque si, si ricorda appunto che nel periodo 95-96 era appena entrato George quindi appunto quello se lo ricorda e per quanto riguarda l'ultima questione riguardo l'underground e band magari italiane death metal che può consigliare e che consiglia per i gruppi underground lui ha detto che principalmente si ricollega anche a quello che lui aveva inizialmente detto per quanto riguarda il suo, la sua attitudine riguardo la batteria nel senso di fare quello che vi piace mh, senza farlo per fama, per fortuna, per soldi che non, non si deve pensare a quello e ha detto per quanto riguarda i, i gruppi italiani ha detto che si ricorda di questo gruppo gli Ideos Divinity con cui avevano fatto tour tempo fa che fanno technical death metal però appunto di per sé non gli vengono in mente tanti altri gruppi più che altro perché lui generalmente non ascolta più tanto death metal quindi questo è quanto eh, ultima domanda <coughs> invece è che ricordi ha per la scena di Tampa, Florida quando c'erano appunto i Morbid Angel di Side stavano muovendo i primi passi con eh, appunto il produttore Scott Barnes ad esempio che produsse di questi eh, lavori qua um, e che album ad esempio dei Decide e dei um, Morbid Angel ad ora attualmente so, eh, esatto. eh, un'altra domanda ad esempio eh, qual è il batterista che lui vorrebbe fare una jam session anche al di fuori del metal estremo quale sarebbe il suo sogno come batterista Okay, um, so Grazie. about the, the Tampa death metal scene, what 
is the the memories you recall from when it first began as a movement, the death metal scene, and about bands like Morbid Angel, Dayside, and also your experience with uh, Scott Barnes. And what is your memory of that period of your yeah, life as a musician? Yeah, you know, it's a very uh, different period because really when you look at it and, and you know the facts, we're from Buffalo, New York. Um, Cannibal Corpse formed in Buffalo and we were there um, <coughs> up until 1994 and then we moved to Tampa, Florida, right? So you're, so you're looking at the, the, the Tampa scene, of course, started before that um, and we weren't a part of it because we weren't from Tampa. So being from Buffalo, moving to Tampa, and then at that point, you're, we're moving in 94, and we're not really a part of the scene per se. Um, you know, like we were part of the Buffalo scene because, yes, when you were starting out in Buffalo, well, we were playing locally in Buffalo. You're, that was, our first shows were all in Buffalo. You know, those were opening for bands that came through, just like probably bands like Deicide and Morbid Angel and Obituary might have played, uh, you know, opening for bands in Tampa at that time. So, like, uh, you know, so we weren't a part of that. So, you know, I can't really answer that. Um, and then, like I said, when we did move to Tampa, finally, we're, we're a touring band already. We're an internationally touring band. It's not like we're moving to Tampa to say, hey, we're going to play the Tampa scene all the time. Sure, you're going to play Tampa. You're going to play it on tour, um, you know, like we would any other city, right? So, mm -hmm. so I can't really answer that because we weren't technically a part of that whole movement back in the, uh, you know, in, in when it all started in the late 80s or what have you in the early 90s. Um, and then the Scott Burns thing, I mean, of course he really, you know, he's a big part of Cannibal. I mean, he produced five of, you know, uh, four of our records, five, five of our records up until Vile there. And, um, you know, that was our reason to come down to Tampa actually, when we uh, being from Buffalo and we sign our contracts with metal blade records, you know, then you find out these things you don't know as, as kids, as musicians, you know, Oh, wow. We don't have to record in Buffalo. You know, we can, we can go somewhere else to record. You know, we didn't know these things. And then when we found them out, we were very excited to want to work with Scott Burns because we heard of, um, you know, in particular, we were really fond of the Sepultura Beneath the Remains production. And, uh, you know, we thought that was amazing. We knew Scott was involved in that. And, um, you know, we heard good things about him. I think he, I can't remember if, you know, if we heard the obituary at that point or whatever, but we, uh, we wanted to work with Scott Burns in Tampa. You know, and that's what we wanted, you know, so it wasn't about coming to Tampa, like I said, even at that point to, to work with Scott, it wasn't about the scene. I, I always look at it as just kind of like, um, like a, a bit of a, uh, you know, just a coincidence, you know, like that, that Tampa ended up having a, a, a bunch of these early death metal bands that became iconic they're f and, and not all of them are from Tampa either. You know, they're implanted, you know, like there's only, I think, you know, like the true Tampa band or two, the true Floridian band would be obituary. Like those guys are born in Florida, you know, mostly every other band, DSI, you know, Mormon angel, those, those are guys that are coming from other places and relocating to Tampa kind of like we did in a sense, you know, um, although their band became popular in Tampa. So kind of, kind of strange how that became, you know, because, um, you know, it just, yeah, weird, but, uh, you know, but yeah, we wanted to work with Scott and Scott was a huge part of our legacy. I mean, uh, being, being there since the beginning, you know, and helping us out big time, kids that didn't know what we were doing, uh, you know, making us sound the way we sound on our records. I mean, that was all Scott. So, so we, you know, we owe a lot to him and, uh, you know, he's a, a pioneer, you know, pioneer in death metal, a pioneer for cannibal. I mean, uh, you know, what an amazing guy and a great guy. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was great to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, it was great to have him uh, with uh, with the team. We always considered him as the sixth member back then, of course, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was, uh, it was great working with Scott, of course. And also talking about obituary, um, I'm sorry, they said, there's still an album that you listen to this day, maybe your favorite, if you have any. 
It would be the first. It, it would be the first DSI. If I was going to listen to any DSI, <laughs> it would be the. It would be the first album. Um, I, I. It's weird. I remember listening to that album a lot. You know, that was a big album for us. I mean, it was kind of weird when we were when we came down to record, eaten back to life. DSI just finished recording, I believe, their album. You know, like their debut. So <laughs> when we first heard DSI, we heard the demo because the album wasn't out yet and and it was just and scott of course did it so so it's kind of weird how both bands almost mirrored each other in the timing of of you know coming out at the you know together there so yeah when we came down and met deicide and heard that deicide it was just uh and, and, and it was called still i am am on at the time you know they weren't even deicide yet and uh it was incredible stuff you know so then when the first deicide did come out i mean that was you know a big album that i listened to you know all the time and and then you know, I, I remember not listening to much of Deicide after that. You know, it, it was weird. Like I don't, I don't remember listening to a lot of Legion. I, I, I know I did, but not as much as I did the first album. You know, so um, yeah, that would be the one, the the, the first Deicide. So, so basically, in your opinion, that album was some sort of breath of fresh air, in a way, in the musical scene at the time. Oh yeah, no, totally. When we heard the DSI, we were blown away. I mean, it was just like, wow, this is crazy. This is like taking Slayer to the next level. I mean, the songs were awesome. Dead by Dawn, what a great song. Sacrificial Suicide. I mean, you know, when we heard these Glenn's vocals, the way he sang and everything, it was just like, man, these guys are crazy. I remember we have footage and it might even be out there online. I mean, I know Jack took a bunch of this footage. We went to go see DSI practice when we were recording the first album and we were just blown away by watching these guys practice you know i mean it was just like these these guys are insane i mean what a what an amazing energetic just <laughs> killer death metal band right up our style like right what you know what we we love to listen to you know so uh yeah i mean uh it, what a, what an amazing band you know and what a big influential band that they were you know that's that's for sure praticamente allora per quanto riguarda l'immagine relativa alla scena di tampa loro non hanno fatto parte da subito come molte delle band death metal che, che sono nate in quel periodo, perché loro sono di Buffalo e sono rimasti a Buffalo fino al 94. E comunque loro hanno iniziato là, quindi comunque si sentono parte più della scena di Buffalo che di quella di Tampa okay. in sé. E... Mh, quindi comunque non ha moltissimi ricordi da quel punto di vista, appunto essendo nati da, da un'altra parte. E per quanto riguarda le, um, Scott, il produttore, comunque lui ritiene che abbiano fatto parte importantissima per quanto riguarda i Cannibal Corps, tanto che lo hanno ritenuto il quinto membro all'epoca, e che comunque è rimasto con loro fino a Vile, per, eh, le, per le registrazioni. E anche per quanto riguarda il poter lavorare con lui è stata una, una scoperta nuova diciamo perché al all'epoca avevano appena firmato con la Metal Blade e si sono ritrovati a mh, non dover necessariamente andare a registrare o rimanere a registrare a Buffalo ma potevano muoversi quindi erano gasatissimi dalla cosa e hanno detto bene, noi vogliamo lavorare con lui e appunto è rimasto con loro per quattro album e appunto lui sia loro come Cannibal Corpse che anche proprio Scott erano fan di, di Sepultura dell'epoca di Beneath quindi comunque si sono anche trovati come, come suoni per quanto riguarda la, la questione dei Dayside se c'è un album che appunto ancora oggi ascolta, lui fa riferimento al primo dei Day Side, perché anche quando sono andati a registrare Eating Back to Life, okay. sono andati nello stesso studio e coincidenza i Day Side, um, quando sono entrati appunto i Cannibal Corpse in studio, loro avevano appena finito di registrare il debut, quindi hanno avuto modo di sentirlo appena registrato in fase demo, diciamo. E 
quello è un album che ancora oggi dice le, è pesante, è molto molto bello e dice che anche per quanto riguarda Glenn la voce non aveva mai sentito nessuno cantare in quella maniera era completamente nuovo e comunque dice che li avevano anche visti eh, in sala prove provare ha detto che già solo da quello aveva capito che era qualcosa di fenomenale e ha ehm, detto che comunque anche per i cannibal puntavano molto a quello, a quello stile diciamo cioè a quel tipo di sound molto molto pesante e diverso dal solito mi viene da dire ok perfetto eh, puoi chiedere a, a Paul se possiamo fare le ultime tre domande e poi lo congediamo ok um, so we would love to bring you the last three questions and then we will let you go and yeah. um, say hi ok vai pure Alan Vai Margherita Van Arca, poi Adimer e poi chiudo io. Ok ragazzi, andate. Uh, Paul, first of all, thanks for your time. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here in the, the Calice Nero. I hope uh, that we can have uh, a, a second talk when the Umbilicus or uh, the next sure. Cannibal Corpse will be out. Sure, uh, my thank you. Thank is, you. My question is uh, uh, asking about moving from Buffalo to Tampa, uh, linking to the past question. Uh, how was the, the scene back in the days in Buffalo? And if you have something uh, to share with, uh, with us uh, about the, the early memory of the Buffalo metal slash punk scene uh, at the time. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. It was great. And Buffalo had a great scene, you know. I mean, uh, part of New York, but of course, Western New York. So we're a little farther than the city, you know, but we had a lot of coming through at that time. Um, back in the 80s, you know, concerts always came through. I mean, it had a, had a, 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 it was a big music scene. A lot of bands from Canada were so close to Toronto and all that. So, uh, uh, I mean, you know, you know we played, uh, you know, Cannibal's first show opening for Dark Angel. I mean, that's amazing, right? You know, we're opening for Dark Angel on our, our very first debut show, you know, and then we open for The Accused and then Creator comes through and you open for, you know, Death and Sepultura, you know, I mean, bands like that. I mean, we had so much coming through. It was like just always something happening. It was, it was great. I mean, we had, we had I thought we had a, an amazing, really, really good scene going on in Buffalo and it still is, you know, when we go back and play our, our, our hometown there you know we we you know, we got a lot of a lot of fans um it's just a it's just a it, it's a good music town so a um, lot of great memories though but yeah that first show how can you forget that dark angel you know we have cannibal corpse debut we're opening for dark angel 450 people packed into this small kind of club i mean it was just it was insane you know and it was uh it was great it was a, it was it was the start of it basically so uh you know looking back i mean yeah we had we had we had great shows we had a lot of fun and uh <laughs> You know, it would be great to be a part of that. Ok, mm, praticamente ha detto che la, la scena di Buffalo eh, all'epoca in cui hanno iniziato era molto molto figa e, e che ancora lo è. Nel senso che comunque anche per loro è significato tantissimo perché appunto hanno, hanno fatto i loro primi show a Buffalo e hanno avuto modo di... A suonare in apertura con band come Dark Angel, Creator, Death, Sepultura quindi che comunque è molto molto importante per loro quello che è successo in questa città e quello che succederà in futuro eventualmente una domanda? Una domanda? ok, um, my last question <coughs> is the following what do you think that um, you feel as a drummer worth um, listening, let's say, as an influence on playing, what do you think that may be like taken and, and try to find points that may be applied in every drummer in the world? Hmm, uh, well... Okay, no, go ahead, finish. No, um, if, if I spoke myself properly, I, I don't know, I have no clue about it. Um, well, I will tell you my, you know, two biggest influences for me anyways. I mean, I think the best drummer of all time is Neil Peart from Rush. 
Um, and I'm sure a lot of uh, drummers feel that way. I mean, you know, obviously there's uh, many drummers in the world, but I mean, Neil Peart was one of the best. I mean, you know, and I love Neil. And I think he's, he had just, he had a, everything, you know, in that kind of a sense. I mean, obviously he's not a thrash metal drummer, death metal drummer, but, you know, just a great, great rock and roll drummer and just, you know, just amazing. And I mean, so I, I, I think Neil, you know, you want to hear great drumming, you listen to Rush um, and you're going to hear some amazing, you know, drums, uh, of course, with some amazing songs. Um, so, and, and then, you know, another uh, Dave Lombardo was my King, of course, you know, when it came down to it, um, from Slayer. So, um, I'll never forget hearing rain and blood for the very first time, you know, already Slayer fans, of course, you know, with Sean Mercy being out haunting the chapel, hell awaits, you know, big fans, but, but rain and blood, he just took it to that next level. And, you know, for me personally, as a drummer, um, as a death metal drummer, as a, a you know, back then, you know, when I'm hearing this drumming for the very first time, th that's what made that album made me want to do what I do today in cannibal, um, hearing that's style and that album in particular it was just so blown away that you're like this is the way i want to try to drum you know um whether i do that um, that's I, I i don't think so but you know that's what that's what made me want to uh you know to push push in that direction um and i think dave's a great drummer he can do a lot of different things as well um i mean overall neil would be the man but you know for for extreme drumming dave i believe is just he, he's just got such a great feel and uh you know those first slayer albums were just you know they're incredible albums so so you feel that these drummers maybe <coughs> also apply to every drummer in the world let's say for um, a kind of influence rather than your influence yeah i mean with. yeah 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 definitely that's why i say neil is in particular mm -hmm. i think you know okay in the in the drumming community you know if, you, if you're a drummer and you talk if you say neil peart i'm sure you've heard of him you know and you probably like love him you know for the most part i would i would guess in my opinion because he's just that great of a drummer he was that amazing and that influential for for modern drumming in a rock sense being rock thrash you know uh, death metal whatever i mean albeit like i said he wasn't playing that kind of style but but his drumming was just that good and that influential in that kind of heavy sort of sense so and it has its signature as well i mean yeah from my remembering of listening to rush right you, you right hear you oh, hear yeah. it's Neil Peart. Oh, uh, oh, totally, you're right. Uh, praticamente gli, ho, gli avevo chiesto che <coughs> batteristi, secondo lui, possono essere parte influenza di un qualsiasi batterista, indipendentemente dal genere e di conseguenza anche quelli che hanno influenzato lui. Lui ha fatto riferimento a Neil Peart dei Rush, che Lombardo. secondo lui... No. Scusa? Anche Dave Lombardo, no? Si deve sì, Lombardi. intanto... Esatto, e lui parla di Neil come batterista a tutto tondo, nel senso che per quanto riguarda i Rush ehm, si sente che è lui e ehm, ha proprio questo <coughs> modo di suonare la batteria che è peculiare e che sicuramente va preso come punto di riferimento per quello che è in futuro, perché appunto non è un batterista trash, non è un batterista death, però ha questo modo di suonare rock che è cioè non lo lui. Cioè, lui capisce che è lui punto per quanto riguarda Lombardo invece ha detto che mh, sì l'ha influenzato decisamente molto di più rispetto a Neil però ehm, appunto è comunque un batterista che l'ha lasciato senza fiato nel senso che anche la prima volta che ha sentito Raining Blood ma anche Show No Mercy Bellissimo. Sono album che l'hanno la, portato ad iniziare a suonare la batteria, quindi comunque ehm, dice che è stato ben più influente nel tutto anche sul suo modo di suonare, nonostante appunto poi abbia fatto da autodidatta tutto il resto. 
Perfetto, allora se torniamo negli anni 90 quando uscì Tomb of Mutilated che ricordi a Paul di quel disco e attualmente i fan quando lo fermano gli chiedono autografi e quant'altro capita che gli chiedono um, qualche anche simmetria di batteria di quel full in particolare quali sono stati anche gli aneddoti più um, folli, pazzi uh, nei tour che hanno fatto i Cannibal Corpse C'ha qualche memoria anche quando sono venuti in Sardegna un paio di anni fa? Um, about the time of Tom of the Mutilated in the 90s, uh, what are your memories from that period of time about the album, about um, the recordings? And there are maybe some fans who still stop you and ask you about some of the drum parts of the album um, or not, maybe. Uh, and if there are any funny anecdotes of the, the time of the album or in general about Cannibal Corpse that you are willing to, to say to us and also about the time you came to, to Sardinia a couple of years ago. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Cool. Um, first off, I just want to mention, yeah, my phone, my phone is going to die here soon. It gave me, and I did find okay. headphones if you, if you noticed here. So I was able to hear, right. Because at the last second, I'm like, wait a minute, I do have a pair. And then I'm on my phone. I don't have a computer and it gave me the low battery warning here. So, so I'm just, just to let you know if by something happens okay. here, though, I know we're going to have to wrap it up soon here, uh, as well, because, uh, It's been a long uh, time here and I need to eat some dinner. Otherwise, I'm not going to make it. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, to, you know, it's tough to remember a lot of that stuff back then. You know, I mean, I, I remember we were just writing some great songs. I'll do I, 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 the one thing I do recall and we put it out there. It's known. In, and I think we put it in our DVD is, you know, not a lot of people maybe, though, remember this or know that. Alex and I were pretty fed up actually with the band a little bit with, with uh, our, our first singer there, um, you know, and we ended up quitting the band, so to say, for about a week, maybe, I think it was. I remember we got done from a tour and we were so fed up with, you know, with, with that guy in particular that we ended up, you know, um, moving our gear out of the, uh, the Cannibal Corpse practice room and moved it down to the hall to another room. And, um, and, and, and Alex started writing hammer smashed face. So it's, it's kind of a funny thing to think back that hammer was written by Alex starting that song. It was me and him basically starting the beginning of that song. And it wasn't with the other guys at that point yet, because we moved our, our gear out of the room. And, you know, like I said, it was, it was short lived. We were probably only, um, We, we were probably, uh, it, yeah, it's given me 10% here. We were, we were probably um, only um, in this practice facility for maybe about 10, uh, a week, 10 days or so before we made up with the guys and everything's fine. And here we go, we're writing the, the, you know, the music for Tomb of the Mutilated. But Hammer Smash Face was technically written with just the beginning of it anyways, was, was, was myself and Alex when we were so-called like, sort of out of the band, I guess, you know, um, which was kind of a, a weird era and a weird time to think about, but that's, that's basically how, what happened then. So, and then other than that, it was just the usual. We, you know, we like to have fun. We like, you know, we were still living in Buffalo. So it was fun going down to Florida to, um, to record, you know, we would commute down, we'd pack in our vans or whatever and drive down to Florida from Buffalo and, you know, and we were just having fun, you know, we, we, we were young, of course, and, you know, we'd be partying a little bit or what have you and, and just, uh, you know, ha having a good time. So that's, that's kind of what I remember about those eras when, you know, everything was young and, you know, yeah, you're not, you don't have families yet. You're not married, all those kinds of things. And, you know, just having a good, good old time. So. Okay. Praticamente lui, mh, al, al scusami, qui. scusami, Francesco, siccome sta scaricando la batteria pure, lasciamo andare sì. e poi lo traduciamo. Uh, Paul, we will let you go since your battery, your phone is dying. So, uh, as uh, uh, an Anarka, Katio Maestro, and Adimir, we want to thank you for your time. Thanks for this uh, amazing interview. Hope to catch you soon with uh, your uh, other project. And uh, thank you for being here at the Calice Nero. 
Thank oh, you thanks, much. guys. Thanks, you guys. Sorry I'm losing the thanks. battery, but I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the interview. And, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. I uh, had, had a lot of, had a great time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Okay. ok, ok, praticamente eh. lui stava dicendo per quanto riguarda la domanda riguardo Tomb of the Mutilated che ricordi ha del periodo. Allora, il ricordo è abbastanza particolare perché comunque in quel periodo stavano scrivendo buone canzoni, però appunto eh, lui ed Alex erano stufi del cantante che avevano all'epoca. Quindi cosa hanno fatto? Praticamente c'è stata una sorta di rottura della band per una settimana, più o meno, in cui loro avevano, lui e Alex appunto, avevano spostato la, la strumentazione in un'altra sala giù, loro erano ancora a Buffalo all'epoca, rispetto alla sala prove dove provavano prima, e in questo periodo, tra l'altro, ironia della sorte, hanno scritto lui ed Alex Hammer Smash Face, e, e questo periodo qua praticamente la, di transizione detto che gli fa simpatia perché comunque una canzone come quella che diciamo tra le più famose mi viene da aggiungere loro se non la più famosa anche per un pubblico casual no? esatto, esatto che mh, praticamente sia stata scritta in un periodo in cui tecnicamente quelli che l'hanno scritta non erano nel gruppo quindi gli, gli faceva simpatia questa cosa qua. Poi al di là di quello, appunto, loro erano giovani, quindi in quel periodo si divertivano, cioè mh, si divertivano anche solo per dire andare giù in Florida a registrare e comunque in generale facevano festa perché appunto erano giovani, non avevano famiglie da, da gestire, eccetera, quindi si passavano il loro tempo tra amici, insomma. Ok, allora ragazzi... Questa è stata l'intervista per il Cannibal Corps, Paul Mazurkiewicz. Non sarà l'unica, questo è un piccolo regalo che siamo quasi sfiorato le due ore addirittura, non un'ora, quindi è stato veramente disponibilissimo. Tra l'altro, sa Sando Paul per la disponibilità, e comunque <coughs> ci sarà, ha detto che ci sarà anche con uh, il suo altro progetto Ambilicus e per, il, per i nuovi The Cannibal Corps lo rinviteremo magari gli chiederemo se può partecipare anche con Alex o con gli altri della band per Alex Webster è un grandissimo storico bass bassista quindi eh, ci proviamo a non farlo diventare un episodio unico del Calice Nero e noi ring io ringrazio anche Francesco per la traduzione e per la disponibilità grazie a voi è stata eh, una massima professionalità proprio di Adimer in in proprio impeccabile e non mancherà in versione traduttore anche il 2 febbraio di 1349 e altre traduzioni che non vi dico nient'altro comunque eh, con il 20... ci vediamo il 2 febbraio e poi il 23 abbiamo la puntata speciale drone noise con ben intervista a tre progetti new rise and troll, news right, news right tron uh, arogat e teatro satanico triple intervista e, e quindi non, non vi preoccupate il calice nero non molla l'underground non molla l'arte e vi ricordiamo sempre di, di mettere mi piace, eh, condividere iscrivervi al canale youtube questa è anche la prima diretta che dove andiamo in simultanea su facebook, grazie a tutti per averci seguito nei commenti ci sta la mail, se avete un progetto volete proporre per il calice nero potete scriverci vi ringraziamo per la disponibilità uh, 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 cattivo messo questa volta vi faccio i saluti finali, bene? Okay, cambiamo okay. un po' quindi salutiamo... esatto perché pure con la voce <ride> salutiamo tutti dal primo all'ultimo che sono stati in diretta con noi per un'ora e 45 ringrazio nuovamente Francesco ringrazio il cattivo maestro per aver contattato Paul e ci vediamo alla prossima puntata del Calice Nero domenica 23 un abbraccio e buonanotte stay metal